Well, basically, I have a short time to talk about two things, forestry and climate change. So everything will obviously be grossly oversimplified. But that said, uh, I do want to raise some issues that I think uh, are really crucial for you to be thinking about in New Jersey, uh, in part because we have so little time left. Uh, the, these images, for example, of the expected ranges of trees are 30 years old. Um, and basically we've done nothing in 40 years. Um, so I'm assuming uh, that we have a very short period of time and have to take really significant action, something that we're completely terrified of uh, as quite obvious. A lot of people's focus has been on trees. They're talking about planting a trillion trees, et cetera. Uh, I wanna focus instead on what I consider to be the low hanging fruit. And that is those things that will give us the highest level of sequestration in the shortest period of time. One, we have to expand existing forest preservation. Um, it's just something you've known about for a very long time, uh, but is critical to this effort to address climate change. And we have to better protect existing forests, which is not very well protected. Only 20% of uh, global forest is protected as intact and about 7% of forest in the US. Uh, so it's a really big deal. We also have to completely reevaluate forest management, i.e. logging uh, and the things that we do in the name of the Forest Service, USDA, Fish and Wildlife. We can restore and release forests too and get very good effect and establish native grasslands because they can store a ton of carbon a year as was demonstrated in the Conservation Reserve Program and turn into really great woodlands. But we have to do these things now because there's no time left. Most people think that state and federal and other publicly owned land is protected from logging. It's not. Um, we do not recognize the importance of forest legally uh, in terms of watershed management. We'll actually end up clearing forest to put in a retention basin and idiot things like that. Uh, forest is not adequately protected in regulations um, for development. For example, setback requirements also often will require um, cutting a forest, which is again, completely absurd. And we have to remove exemptions for roads, infrastructure, and septic, et cetera. Uh, you could drive large trucks through the exemptions for uh, big roads. Currently forest harvesting, i.e. logging, accounts for about 85% of the carbon lost yearly from forests. If current practices continue, we will have our sequestration potential from forests. So, so much on counting on them for doing something uh, for climate service uh, change. If you look at the Forest Service's five priorities, they do not include biodiversity, carbon storage, or climate change. I think in terms of the highlands, we can certainly put those right at the top uh, of your concerns when we add in water. Management, despite all their claims, basically increases erosion, it increases fire risk, it increases damage by invasive and ungulates in general, and loss of carbon, including from the soil. Thinned forests have major issues. Natural forest is more fire resilient. When they log, they often take the most fire resistant material leaving fat slash. The Western fires exploded many of the myths of forest thinning um, in Oregon, uh, they went completely bonkers when they hit, it, hit the heavily thinned areas. Uh, natural forest is more insect resistant. And as I mentioned, harvesting reduces carbon uh, capture. People are generally very resistant to, um, uh, for example, prescribed burning, uh, but that's in part because the forest service keeps telling them they can do it by thinning and it just has not been effective. In New Jersey, we've seen two very significant consequences one, of course, is the creation of extensive areas of empty forest uh, because deer numbers increase so rapidly. And secondly, the infested forest because invasives, uh, this should have been garlic mustard, which I think is the New Jersey most ubiquitous deer related uh, plant of all. And of course, we're learning our, we, we're losing our conservative species of which we were really rather famed uh, for our woodland ephemerals, et cetera. 
the impacts to soil are consistently under uh, estimated and often unrecognized completely. 40% of annual carbon storage goes to fungal root networks every single year from woody trees. The upper layers of soil can, can accumulate carbon at very, very rapid rates, uh, but it's lost when uh, trees are harvested and it can go on for uh, decades. Uh, soil loss, uh, losses of carbon are twice as great in thin forests as they are in natural forests. And of course, salvage logging is a catastrophe from that perspective. Where we need to go, where New Jersey needs to go, and what you guys should really be push pushing as hard as you can is proforestation. Uh, to quote Muma, is growing forests to reach their ecological potential for carbon storage and wood and soils in the absence of human disturbance. New England forests could store about three times as much carbon as now. We could double current carbon storage globally. Uh, these things are really very doable um, and the impact is instantaneous. The little ice age, which was once uh, claimed to be um, caused by sunspots, they now realize was, the cause, was caused by the slaughter of 58 million Native Americans in the New World and the inst almost instantaneous regrowth of 59 million acres of forest. The climate clock was reset very dramatically and lasted, those changes lasted for 150 years until of course 1850 when the Industrial Revolution came about and we began our um, moving in the other direction very rapidly. Uh, when we look overall though, the forest carbon reserves are worth about 10 to 80 times the timber value of cutting that forest. Unfortunately, the forestry people do not look at it this way. Uh, I think this is Emile's favorite quote from the New Jersey Forestry Associ Association. And I hope you're all play, paying close attention because if you don't manage them, they're gonna die. This unfortunately is the basic approach that is taken to um, climate and climate change across the boards. If you look at all of these entities, um, they're all getting money from the USDA, from the Forest Service, and all of them are cutting focused. It's how do we change our cutting a little bit so that we can say we have reacted to climate change, we're better prepared for climate change. We may even have reduced it ever so slightly, but we are not focusing on how much we can reduce it. And it's all about species suitability, not the sequestration of carbon. And we have really big obstacles uh, Trump has ordered a 40% increase in cutting in national forests and on BLM land. We have all of these sort of financial arrangements uh, that value uh, a forest uh, only once it's cut. And the market wants big trees. That's just something we have to face. The Young Forest Initiative, of course, has come along to convince you all that you really have to do that. And if that's not good enough, we'll give you bioenergy. Big tree logging was how I got involved with Emil in the Highlands, uh, with your crowd in the Highlands, uh, because of cutting that was proposed uh, in Huntington County. Uh, but everywhere we went, every plan was really about big tree logging. When we went to Weldon Brook, for example, over which there was much wrangling about why do you have to go into the oldest, biggest area first? Of course, this was it. The green trees are the trees that were there. The blue is what they said they would cut. The red is what really got cut. And that's unfortunately what it's all about. Um, as Julia was talking about in one of the studies, one large tree sequestered more carbon in one year than a medium sized tree had in a lifetime. The largest 1% of the trees in a forest typically store 50% of the carbon. Carbon sequestration increases with size for centuries. The, we are not overstocked or over <laughs> mature in New Jersey. These terms do not apply to carbon storage. Forests need large trees in order to start, store carbon. And most of the trees in this country are in the 70 to 80, 90 range and have centuries ahead of them. New Jersey's uh, a bit on the older side, uh, happily for us. Young forest is how uh, logging in old forests is being promoted around here. Uh, I don't want to say there's nothing 
uh, to the Young Forest Initiative, it's a very valid concern. Uh, 22 species out of 38 are in decline. Uh, the problem is in implementation, where other forest values were ignored. And in New Jersey, there's been exceptionally poor site selection, in part because people want to go into older, undisturbed forests so they don't have to deal as extensively with invasives or deer after cutting. But in the interior forest, we have 28 species in decline. And there are extensive opportunities to restore young degraded forest, which is all over New Jersey. If you've ever followed riparian corridors, all being converted to cow repair, you know what I'm talking about. The other problem with the kind of young forest that um, really needs to be created is that it requires maintenance and that doesn't give you any revenue. If you want revenue, you have to do rotational clear cuts or seed tree cups, cuts, which is exceedingly disruptive to non-woody plant species. We see this happening up in Massachusetts uh, at the Quabbin. Unfortunately, government's incentives are all about doing that. Uh, the $1,400 that comes from NRCS to help you clear your woods should go instead to helping you protect your woods. Bioenergy is another thing that gets pushed uh, as if it has some ecological value. All federal agencies are required to assume that bioenergy is carbon neutral. This is something Susan Collins got into legislation for all federal funding. And of course, it's a crock of. Uh, it's 70% more production of CO2 than BTUs, uh, significantly more than natural gas or fuel oils. And regrowth does not balance out cutting even after decades, um, eight, like a century or more. It's the most expensive source of energy. It depends completely on subs subsidies, which functionally are perverse incentives for forestry. And the forest is making deals with states right now. Uh, Massachusetts is all in, I mean, is not all in and is fighting it, but Maine, um, is moving ahead and Connecticut's being pushed. Massachusetts has been resistant all along and has three times uh, the carbon density of the forest in Maine. And don't think it's not coming here. The Rutgers Ecoplex uh, did a bioenergy plan uh, to create a strong foundation for these, recommending the establishment of the whole effective institutional, regulatory and feedstock infrastructure. Forest is not feedstock. In terms of implementing far pro forestation, we have a lot of really good opportunities. The new forest stewardship plans for forest for private forests in New Jersey are absolutely extraordinary and give you the opportunity to do all of this. Publicly owned land can all be done immediately as long as there's enough public pressure to make people do this. And if you think this is hard in New Jersey, you go try it at the federal level. This should begin with land trusts and municipalities where there is less pressure. And we obviously have to get rid of this nonsense of um, not recognizing the value and uh, rewarding uh, subsidies and incentives towards preservation. Uh, this is one example of a forest garden in New Jersey uh, where a neighbor put up a fence and within 20 years, he had the kind of forest uh, we had when I was a child. Uh, in terms of better forestry, we do have to separate working forests from intact natural forests. New Jersey is filled with lots of intact natural forests. Uh, Julia mentioned uh, Sparta Mountain, but almost every square inch of Malin Dickerson should also be preserved as an intact natural forest. Uh, we don't have a lot of working forests, but we do have a lot of extremely degraded forest uh, that could be turned into effective working forests if the dollars uh, ran a little differently. Um, and of course, we have to get into restoring forest. I want to focus in particular only on fire uh, and rewrite, rewilding at this moment. Charred forests store more carbon than thin forest. And it's really important to remember that. And if you think we aren't going to have a fire sometime, we will. We are not California, uh, but the phenomenon of feast and famine in terms of water with climate change we will have droughts and we will see fires. We saw them less than uh, a dozen years ago. Uh, we could reduce, studies show that we could reduce carbon loss by 60% in the West. We could probably do the same in the East. 
intact forest is less susceptible to fire. And from the perspective of the Highlands Coalition, it supports understory regeneration. Residents are usually the biggest objectors. Forest fire is a natural process. It, this is happening in Morris County right now where they're burning and we're seeing a wonderful return of understory, including desirable oaks and valuable uh, woodland ephemerals. Rewilding, I think is another concept that should really be examined. It's a whole lot cheaper than planting. Natural regeneration uh, has a high success rate. Planting has a high failure rate. Um, and often species are poorly sited or poorly selected. Or in plantation situations, they use fast growing trees that aren't so good. But wildlife really loves recovered forest. And Russia all around Chernobyl and all is returning a lot. And England has targeted 25% uh, forest cover over time. We're in the decade of restoration now. Uh, we really have to push at every level and it'll all come from the grassroots upward. Um, and um, the bottom line is in New Jersey, natural heritage areas, state parks, wildlife management could all go into no cut right now. Just don't shift to foreign wood. It's a really bad substitute. There are a lot of other alternatives and Canada has a halfway decent job. Thank you. There are a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, would you please talk more about deer remediation? Edward, I don't know what you mean by remediation. Perhaps you could explain that a little better, unless, Leslie, you know exactly what he's talking about. Well, perhaps um, deer remediation is a polite way of uh, talking about, um, say, population control, uh, what municipalities, what homeowners, uh, and what say even subsidies there should be to help um, uh, say deer control? Well, in fact, the coalition I think has written fairly extensively on this and has good guidelines. Um, and Hopewell, Ta Hopewell Township is doing an extraordinary job of deer management um, with Michael Van Cliff. Uh, I think you can, there are professionals in the area who really can put together coordinated programs. Uh, but farmers have to be working all together uh, so that hunting is happening at the same time, things like that. It's really kind of incredible. And it's hard because the we basically have a Purdue chicken population right now. Everybody's young, twinning and tripleting, uh, because that's what intensive hunting produces. And um, there's nothing resembling a natural demographic. of We need some old lady deer like me. Leslie, sorry, that made me Thank laugh. Thank you. Okay, well, we don't so twin and triple it. Yes. For, uh, from Tracy Chapman, we have a strong focus on farm preservation here in Warren County. They aren't forests, but do farms still help capture carbon? Yes, they can. Um, there has been sort of a lot of ongoing uh, study in terms of things like rotational grazing. Um, and there's a lot of argument about how much carbon is actually stored, uh, but there is not this uh, simultaneously loss of carbon that would ha be happening with traditional um, agriculture. Monoculture is one of the, sing and plant are the single biggest sources of uh, carbon loss. So it's a, a really serious problem, but native grasslands, as I mentioned, can store a, a ton of carbon per acre. There was a fabulous, uh, program in New Jersey, the LIP Landowner Incentive Program, that allowed you to stack uh, easements so that you could get an e uh, you know an easement from NRCS plus an easement from New Jersey, and we had hundreds of acres of grassland and all kinds of grassland birds, and if I could do anything, I would bring that program back in New Jersey. Well, we have now have a blizzard of questions for you. <laughs> Leslie, um, are there, from Matt Polsky, are there economic opportunities to doing forestry right? Well, it's a, I wish I could say I knew of a lot of economic opportunities for doing forestry right. Um, at this point, I think it's kind of limited. Um, New, Pennsylvania caught on with the idea of doing a lot of um, pellets. But of course, a lot, and, and of course, the South is being destroyed 
uh, by pellet, you know, pellet logging that's going to Europe. Right now, I would do no logging and I would do a lot of lobbying for payment for protecting forests. The same forester that is counting the cut stumps could be counting the trees you protected. Thank you. From Mark Lobauer, how would these principles apply to the forests of the Pinelands where the trees tend to be younger and more frequently impacted by wildfires than in the highlands? Well, I'm a, a big fan of prescribed burning. Um, somebody mentioned the mapping that I had done for the um, New Jersey Pinelands. Uh, but part of the problem was we were using, uh, at the time I first started, it was 1968 and we were doing 1960 aerials and the Chatsworth fire had burned hundreds of thousands of acres. So we had to go back to not only old aerial photographs, but one of the things we could see was this singular blocks of green that had not burned, uh, that had been prescribed burned. Um, so I'm a big fan of prescribed burning. I think it needs to mimic natural fire a little more than it does. I think it can be very regular and produce a boring landscape. Uh, but in terms of fire protection, uh, I think it's the biggest thing you can do. And of course, we've got to stop with this idea that large lots uh, with isolated houses is good for any landscape, whether it's the pine lands exposing it to fire or um, the highlands. You're looking at a thousand feet all around of damaged forests. So uh, it's just an idea that has to go away. Well, Mark follows up by saying, would you be interested in making this presentation to the Climate Change Committee of the New Jersey Pinelands Commission? If so, consider yourself invited. Oh, well, thank you. You, you contact me by email. We'll see. I found a typo in this one. <laughs> okay. It did work in the end. So from Alan Hunt, do you, what do you recommend for managing second growth forest effectively on private lands? I have a six acre woodlot on rocky terrain, susceptible to blowdowns and invasive invasion. Riparian forest undergoing increased stream bank erosion and hedgerows with very old ash trees now dying from emerald ash borer. I have hunters to work on the deer issue. NRCS only pays very little for cost sharing. I want to do more, but I'm afraid of private loggers taking the wrong tree and the costs and time of doing more. What advice do you have for private forest landowners? Well, I will still keep pushing for not logging. Give yourself a 10 year window. You can probably write a forest stewardship plan that involves a much longer uh, rotation. Um, I understand the issue of finances and your uh, invasives in some areas will get worse. As that forest thickens though, some others won't. When you mention emerald ash borer, it does remind me though, there are going to be a lot of gaps in these forests. Uh, between disease, blowdowns, and climate change, uh, I see gaps in forests fall forming all over the place. So I don't need loggers coming in and making more gaps uh, in the forest. Uh, I think the LIP program, the Landowner Incentive Program, uh, and other uh, programs in the state, you should be pushing extremely hard. We've got, what, five years left? I mean, <laughs> you can't cut. From George Casser, are there any examples of private owners of large tracts of forest for commercial harvesting who embrace proforestation principles or are they mutually exclusive? I think proforestation is new enough uh, that I don't think I could give you any um, people. I know, um, I know some people who are working very progressively, whether they've adopted proforestation. I did a, a lecture only like a year and a half, two years ago, and I wasn't using that term yet. Uh, no, I think it's your job to make everybody aware of the fact that this is a globally hot topic. Uh, the people are confronting the fact, the fact that nothing would have a more rapid impact on climate uh, than doing something like this. It would cost $40 billion a year to stop all, uh, to buy up all logging contracts. Um, the US and the European Union spend $60 billion a year 
uh, subsidizing fossil fuels. Uh, there's obviously money uh, in various pockets that could solve this problem. So I'm going to ask one more uh, question on the private forestry uh, issue from John Landau. With the new forest stewardship program, are we missing an opportunity to more aggressively recruit the New Jersey private forest owner to better practices? Absolutely. I, I believe there are over 8,000 and the average lot is pretty small. And um, a huge number of uh, these people do not want to log. They may have a forester who's telling them they have to log. I know of foresters who are telling people you still have to log when you do not have to log. Uh, get yourself another forester if you're told that. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, one of the complaints I heard was that women who own forest tend to be less uh, easily uh, sucked into logging. Ownership by women of forests is increasing dramatically, both across the U.S. and in New Jersey. So I appeal to all women, stop all logging now. <laughs> Thanks, Leslie. <laughs> so from Sylvia, can you please discuss again how intact forests sequester more carbon than fragmented and how the current practices of logging on public lands are not taking into consideration the species that require an intact forest canopy? Canopy, excuse me. Well, she, she gives like examples, red shoulder talk and barred owls. Well, for starters, when um, it, it is this problem of the large tree market, and you've seen that in every forest management plan that has been provo uh, proposed, whether it's a wildlife management area, whether it's uh, a county forest, um, they're all focused on starting in an area where the big trees are. Uh, and that is not an accident. Uh, all of them talk about um, the even age forest uh, at 70 to 80, 90 years. That's not what they end up cutting. So <clears throat> I, I think it's a really difficult uh, problem in that way. Um, I lost a little track right there. Give me another question, Julia. Okay, well, this one is is uh, our last one and is slightly different. And I'm not sure if you were aware of the solar expansion bill, S2605. The question is, can you explain the potential impact on New Jersey forests with the solar expansion bill? Forests should not be cut for solar, period. Um, I saw a big environmental award that went for a giant forest cut for solar. Um, I understand people's concern about farmland being used for solar as well, but it does not destroy the capacity of farmland to be a farm. It destroys the capacity of a forest to be a forest. Uh, so I think there's absolutely no comparison. And there are all kinds of opportunities for solar uh, between parking lots, large, big box, rooftops, grocery stores, et cetera. Um, no, forest should not be used for solar, period. Well, Leslie, I want to thank you very much. I know that we've kept this going for longer than we had said we would, and we really appreciate it. It sounds like me to me like there's a lot of interest and perhaps there's a future webinar in the making. You can see how comfortable I am with these. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Leslie. We really appreciate it.